Hi, I'm Nick Savides. I want to get better at connecting with people, so I'm putting together a couple of videos as an experiment. This one is based on my recent trip to California a couple weeks back when I got to meet Carlton Cuse, one of the showrunners on Lost, and I got to visit Disneyland for the first time. What you're seeing here is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, the Star Wars themed part of Disneyland. This is Docking Bay 7, the food court at Galaxy's Edge, where I happened to be while tweeting this photo of me and Carlton that I had taken the day before. Now, you might be wondering why was I spending valuable time at Disneyland sharing a tweet about me and Carlton? It's a good question. It's complicated. It's complicated. Oh, yes. The short answer is, it felt like I should. The longer version, the full story, is a tangled one, almost 10 years in the making. I'm going to try to untangle it for you here, even though it hurts to revisit parts of it. And I'm going to try to do that as honestly as I can. Why? Well, if I could answer that succinctly, I probably wouldn't need to make this video. But at stake is the very nature of reality and our perceptions of it. Can our lives have meaning, purpose, connection, or is it just a bunch of random, meaningless coincidences? Is it crazy? to believe that things can work out for us in a big picture kind of way, even when they haven't for so long, even when the dissonance set in motion seems to perpetually undermine that possibility. These are some of the questions that Lost explores and some of the questions I was considering as I prepared to meet with Carlton. My questions remain even after the meeting, so I'm making this video searching for answers. But that search for answers, that search for truth, might just endanger the very filmmaking career I've been working so hard to build for years. Why? Stick around and I will try to answer those questions. But just so you know, it's rabbit holes all the way down. To paraphrase the song from Jefferson Airplane, if you go chasing rabbits, then you know you're sure to fall. In case you're wondering, that's from Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin at Disneyland. I couldn't resist throwing it in because Chasing Rabbits, Roger... Ra okay. This is going to be a longer video, even for me. But then the big questions can't always be answered succinctly. Since it is going to be a longer video, I want to give you some sense of where we're going and what kind of video this is and isn't. I don't have any groundbreaking theories about the mysteries of Lost. I'm sure there are all kinds of forums and chat rooms out there that can be of more help in that area. This is going to be a personal story about how Lost has influenced the way I see the world, how I got to meet one of the show's creators, and the impact that both had on my life. Along the way, I will address the big questions I mentioned moments ago, while also sharing some thoughts on Disney. Hamlet, and Harry Potter. And, and, I'm going to try to make it all connect by the end. 
Yes, this is a longer video, but then I'm fairly confident that you can get through it faster than you could David Foster Wallace's book, Infinite Jest, which also makes reference to Hamlet. But in the case of this video, you won't need a companion book and or a secret decoder ring. Plus, watching this is shorter than re-watching a season of Lost. So, there's that. I should also mention that this is going to be a serious conversation where weighty philosophical topics are discussed. So I'm not going to act like a fanboy and geek out over certain things that will... Oh, ah, uh, sorry about that. Uh, where was I? Bringing gravitas to weighty philosophical questions. I'll give you more of the backstory in just a moment, but since this is a video mostly about my trip to California recently, let's start at the airport. This is the recently revamped Louis Armstrong New Orleans International Airport. The updated terminal area opened November 6th, 2019, but this was my first visit to the updated area, and I have to say, it was a really nice improvement. After I got past airport security, I noticed Mondo, one of the restaurants in the airport. Mondo has a presence in New Orleans, but also an airport version of the restaurant. An inviting space. It caught my attention. And I was curious about it, but it went beyond that. It felt like I should go for whatever reason. Now, you're going to hear me talk about that throughout this video. It comes up again and again. It felt like I should go. I had a sense that I should do this or that. It's actually one of the central questions of this video. Does it make sense to trust that sense? So I should probably tell you a little bit about what I mean when I say that. It goes beyond a momentary sensation. Like, I felt hungry, I felt tired, I wanted to relax. Those are all valid perceptions and we would respond to them, but it goes beyond that. Whether it's some kind of intuitive sense from myself, some unconscious or subconscious awareness, or guidance from something out there, that part is the question and whether it makes sense to listen to that. So anyway, I got this sense that I should go. My initial sensations were actually going against that a little bit. I wasn't all that hungry. I was thinking, you know, I'm going on a trip to California. I want to save some money for the trip itself. But I thought, well, you know, it's a nice space. It's inviting. It's a chance to relax and I'll just get something small. There was something else as well. I hadn't been drinking for a while. A couple of months, actually. I made it through Thanksgiving and Christmas without drinking. So I thought, well, why put myself in this situation? If I'm going to be at the bar, the drinks will be right there. But I still had the sense that I should go. All right went and sat at the bar. I ordered a tonic, but no gin, and soup. And I got to meet the bartender. This is Pamela, the lady who was taking care of me while I was there. And she told me that she works at a couple places around town, not just the airport. She also worked at the Superdome when LSU won the championship for college football a couple days back. 
that actually has special significance to me. I first came to Baton Rouge in 2011 when LSU had their great undefeated run all the way up until the championship game, which many of us don't count because it didn't feel like LSU showed up to play that game. So anyway, they had that great winning streak. I wasn't a fan of the Tigers before, but I came to Baton Rouge. It's a big college football town and people were inviting, let me hang out, be a part of their cookouts and whatnot. So how could I not be a fan after that great season? And it did make me feel like maybe I was in the right place. I wasn't sure about moving to Louisiana, but it felt like it was something I was supposed to do. So they won when I moved until the championship game, and then they finally won the championship game this year, undefeated all the way through, including the championship game. So Pamela mentioned that to me. That was kind of neat. The LSU game was something that I would discuss briefly with Carlton Cuse when we met. So there's that connection, I guess. Here in the video, you see me waiting in line to board the plane. It's as good of a time as any to tell you about my connection to Lost. Not that I would use this as a conversation starter while at the airport. As you probably know, Lost isn't just a TV show that involves a plane crash that happens at the very beginning of the show, but it's also a show that reminds you of the plane crash in almost every episode. So mentioning it at the airport is probably not the best icebreaker or a way to make friends and influence people, but it'll have to do for this here. I don't remember how exactly I got onto Lost. I'm usually not the person that jumps right into something. I like to wait and see if it's getting um, any kind of traction. So that was like that for Lost. I came on board, I think, around the fourth or fifth season. I had heard from a couple different people I respect that Lost was notable, but also that it was dealing with faith in a thoughtful way. A number of characters on the show have a sense of faith, even though it differs from one character to the next. And there is that contrast between faith and science, but it's an aspect of the show that's important. And unlike other TV shows or popular culture content, Lost doesn't treat the search for meaning, the personal faith that someone has as a handicap or something to be made fun of. It presents it as one way, a valid way to search for answers and meaning while going through something strange, challenging, and so on. So that was interesting. And I heard a couple of people I respect say as much. So eventually I got interested and started watching a combination of DVDs and ABC streaming. And then I want to say around the fifth or sixth season, I was caught up and then watching the episodes as they came out. Around that time, towards the end of the fifth, beginning of the sixth season, I also became aware of The Lost Podcast. It's an official show from the showrunners Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof. And that was probably when I first became aware of them as creators. I mean, I was aware of their names, I think, vaguely, but then the podcast allowed me to get to know them to a degree in, in the way that you get to know someone that you hear on a regular basis. It was also one of the early podcasts that I was checking out. Not the first. I was listening to others before that, like This Week in Tech, a couple others, but it was an early podcast I got into. And I like the way that the Lost podcast gave you some of the ideas and the thinking behind the episode. So the episode would come out and then the showrunners would elaborate. They'd share the spoilers, but also here's what we were thinking. Here is 
uh, here's some of the ideas that went into this and so on. The podcast is also notable because I would eventually do a film and music podcast. Now, I'm not saying that The Lost Podcast was the reason that I did my show, and Savidi's podcast, which became Nick Sav Film and Music Show, but it was an influence. It was one of a couple of podcasts that I heard early on that resonated, that inspired me. And so it has that influence on me. In the back of my mind, I was thinking, yeah, that, that was a cool show. You get to know the people and the ideas behind this series. That's kind of neat. And my show, I, I'm usually bringing in filmmakers, musicians, writers, interviewing them about their ideas. So again, an influence. Uh, moving on. The finale for Lost. A contentious episode, for sure. I haven't run into anyone who's seen the Lost series finale and has just been lukewarm about it. People either really, really, really don't like it or they really, really, really like it. I am in the latter camp. I loved the finale. I was ecstatic by it. It felt like anything was possible after I saw it. The only other time I remember feeling quite like I did after watching the Lost Finale was when the New York Giants beat the New England Patriots in the 2008 Super Bowl. As you may recall, that's the one with that insane helmet catch by David Tyree, the one that was dubbed the Immaculate Connection, Immaculate being a riff on Immaculate and Eli Manning, all right, or the double miracle. It was just so wild to see, so unexpected. No one thought the Giants had a chance. Even I had my doubts. I had followed them all through the season, but I had my doubts. And then that happened. NFL Top 10 named the helmet catch to be the greatest Super Bowl play of all time. Here's a clip from that show. Pay attention because it relates to the conversation ahead. David Tyree went up and so somehow was able to make the catch. It's Shakespearean. Only God kind of stuff. I'll tell you, 2007 was a rough year for me. It was the year when my dad died. He got a brain aneurysm unexpectedly and passed away a few days later. So that was a destabilizing time. And so seeing the Giants win in a big way gave me hope. I couldn't help but feeling like that Super Bowl win was at least a little bit for me. And that's how loss made me feel. Shortly after seeing it that night, I had this sense again that I should reach out to Carlton and Damon. This was not something I had done extensively before. Twitter the notion that you could reach out to public figures, relatively new, although they talked a little bit about some of the fan engagement they got on their podcast. So I thought, all right, well, I'm going to reach out and, and say hello and, and share my appreciation for them. So this is what I shared with them that night, right after I saw the finale. That was the first of many times I would reach out to Carlton by Twitter. I don't know the exact number because, well, I'll get to that in a moment. But my count is at least 57 times plus over the course of 10 years. That finale, 2010. So it literally is 10 years off and on. Not every day. I wasn't that much of a fan, but that's a substantial amount for me, considering that I'm not 
generally reaching out to people on Twitter. I'm selective about the people I reach out to on Twitter. There are a handful of people that I've reached out to far more than others. And I would say Carlton Cuse is one of those people. Sometimes it was appreciation. Sometimes it was a little stranger. Unusual things to say, right? I read some of them now and I think, why did I say that? And then there was South by Southwest. This was 2013. For those of you who haven't been, they do a lot of the um, festivities at the convention center or near the convention center. But then there are other areas that have additional supplemental content. So there's a street on Rainey where a number of companies will take over the houses and make it the uh, Adobe house or Sennheiser or whatever. In this case, I had gotten an email from Pace Magazine and they mentioned they were doing a special event at South by Southwest. It would be the Paste Sennheiser house. And uh, all right, interesting, but even more interesting was that Carlton Cuse was one of the people speaking. On top of that, at the very same house, later on their schedule, friends of mine were playing. The band name was Bison back then. They've since updated their name to Las Bison. But uh, I had seen Las Bison perform a couple times. And so I thought, hey, that would be kind of neat. Carlton is going to be speaking. So maybe I could say hello to him. And then my friends are performing so I could see them perform. And once again, it felt like I should go. The trip to South by Southwest 2013 came together in a last minute sort of a way. I didn't even think I was going to make it on time. I barely did. I just got there in time to park, get settled in, and then got to see and hear Carlton do a little Q&A. It was an intimate space, like a little bit bigger than a living room, but I was close enough to get this photo with my phone. And then Carlton was sticking around a little bit afterwards, saying hello to people. And I waited in line, waited to try to say hello. And then as it got to me, as it got close to that time when I could say hello, he left. And that stung a little bit. At the time, I thought that he saw me, that he recognized me and didn't want to say hello and left as a result. I don't think that's what happened now. Looking back on it in retrospect, I don't think that's what happened now. But that was my impression that stung and I was trying to make sense of it all. So I wrote a blog post about that, but also going to South by Southwest and all the little things that happened along the way. I'll link to that below, but uh, just so you know, that's one more trip down the rabbit hole. It's rabbit holes all the way down here, folks, but it's there if you wanna go and take a look. That was how I saw that incident at the time. So I, I think that may have had an influence when I started my podcast. So that happened in March 2013. I started my podcast in November 2013. And then I went back to South by Southwest a couple times. In 2017, I got a press pass to do podcast coverage at South by Southwest. Sebastian Younger, New York Times bestselling author of The Perfect Storm and co-director of the acclaimed documentary Restrepo, was one of the people I got to interview at the festival. 2018, I got to do a live episode at the festival as an official South by Southwest event. 
I was excited about that. That's not something that happens to a lot of podcasts. At the time, it was just a handful of podcasts that got selected. And my show is up against shows that are backed by a radio station or a powerful podcast network like Gimlet Media. For me, it was just my show. I have guests, but I'm putting it together, hosting it, editing it, all that jazz, just me. So like, all right, that's kind of neat. Thank you, South by Southwest, for the vote of confidence here. And then uh, I went back again in 2019 and did podcast coverage once again. Actually, in 2019, I got to interview Les Bison for my podcast. This was to coincide with their performances at South by Southwest. Remember, Les Bison was the band I originally went to see on my first visit to the festival. So, in a sense, it was coming full circle. One more thing about South by Southwest 2019, I went back to Rainy Street, where the Paste Sennheiser house had been back in 2013. That house had become, at least for part of South by Southwest 2019, the American God's House, the show based on the book by Neil Gaiman. That's interesting to me because I had written about Neil Gaiman just three blog posts after I had mentioned the situation at South by Southwest. And that was the last blog post that I wrote before I put my blog on hiatus. It was just a couple weeks after I wrote about Carlton. Um, in fact, the post right after the one about South by Southwest was my deep dive into William Shakespeare's work and Neil Gaiman got a mention there as well. So there's that connection, but it goes a little bit beyond that. Neil Gaiman also had another show at South by Southwest 2019, Good Omens, based on his book that he co-wrote with Terry Pratchett, has since become an Amazon Prime series. And they did a, a special installation for Good Omens. Now, as it happens, while I was in California, I was working on the Connection Experiment video about my time in Nashville. And I included the Good Omens bit from South by Southwest, and there's been dissonance attending past South by Southwest festivals as well. So that was something I was working on while in California, right before I went to see Carlton, because it felt like I should. Remember that photo I tweeted of me and Carlton while I was at the Star Wars dining area? At the same time, I also tweeted an update about the Nashville Connection Experiment because those two things felt related in my mind because it felt like I should. As I was putting together this video, I kept coming back to this question. If the incident with Carlton Cuse hadn't happened back in 2013, would I have been trying to get into the festival as fervently back in 2017, 2018, 2019? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It may have been in the back of my mind that uh, I wanted to show in some way that I mattered. There may have been that kind of thinking in the back of my mind, but it's the kind of thing that I can't spend too much time dwelling on because otherwise I'll just never get this video done. And uh, we have a few more rabbit holes to get through before this is going to finish. 
All that to say, though, that Carlton has had an influence on me in so many ways. His work has been in the back of my mind and shaped creative project I've pursued, whether the podcasts or short films I've done, or just the kinds of shows that I'm drawn to now as a result. He's had a, an outsized influence, one of the few people in my life who's had that kind of influence, probably in ways that I can't even fully understand or articulate. Well, I told you it was going to be a deep dive down the old rabbit hole, and I haven't even told you about the numbers yet. I guess I should. If you've watched a couple of episodes of Lost, you probably noticed that certain numbers tend to show up in different ways, notable ways. Sometimes it seems random, but then later you see, oh, it is interconnected, actually. The numbers being... And that makes tonight's Mega Lotto Jackpot drawing. Four, eight, 15, 16, and 23, with the mega number 42. Whoever has those numbers has won or will share in a near record jackpot. That's right, Mary Jo, because this is the 16th week without a winner. Now, I'm not going to touch on all the numbers, the connections in the show. That's out there. Look it up if you're curious. But it did make me aware of a certain number in particular the number 23. Now, I was noticing the number in my life. It seemed to be showing up more so than other numbers. And it, it may have been lost that helped me to realize this. Um, around that time, there was also the 23 film that Jim Carrey did. And uh, that film, while fictional, is based in part on the 23 Enigma. That's another thing you can look up. 23 has had notable appearances throughout history, prominent events. Sometimes they mention the birth and death of William Shakespeare in that. He died on April 23rd. It was initially believed that he was also born on April 23rd. Now, there's some uncertainty about that, in part because some people seem to think like, well, that's just too much of a coincidence. But there's some pretty trippy coincidences that show up with the 23 Enigma. Look it up. It's a real thing. It's uh, another trip down the rabbit hole for sure. Now, those of you who are Shakespeare enthusiasts and scholars might be thinking this would be a good time for him to share his thoughts on Hamlet. I hear you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I appreciate it. But I'll get to that soon. Not yet. Or text me and uh, we'll chat about it whenever you want. All right, Stratford upon Avon girl. Where was I? Bringing gravitas to weighty philosophical questions. Now, the rest of you might be thinking, okay, so the number shows up in a couple of places. Those are just coincidences. Possibly. But what if there's more to it? That depends a little bit on how we see the world. What is the nature of the reality we inhabit? Is it just that we're living in a material world, as Madonna might suggest? Well then, yes, appearances of certain numbers would be entirely coincidental. What if there's more to our world than just the material reality? What if there's more to it than just atoms and molecules, chemicals, right? We're all just some complex mix of chemistry and biology and we have people. That's it, just here's the equation. What if there's more? What if there is purpose, destiny, karma, the hand of providence? These are things that 
philosophers, religious people, even scientists at times have wrestled with. And in that kind of world, it would be possible, conceivable, that there would be discernible patterns, reflections of the guiding hand of providence. Now, that might seem strange, but it's there in things like horoscopes, divination, but also in more respectable sources. Pythagoras, the mathematician who gave us the Pythagorean theorem, also had notions of harmonics. Certain numbers are, are pleasing together. Help develop musical theory. This fresco is the School of Athens, painted by Raphael. You may have seen this before. The seated man here, writing in a book, is Pythagoras. And nearby, you see a young man presenting him with a tablet that has a lyre on it. A lyre being one of the early musical instruments. This shows us that even in the Renaissance, when the fresco was painted, Pythagoras was understood to have a key influence on music development. And some of his ideas about numbers suggest that numbers have sacred qualities or sacred relationships. That kind of thinking developed amongst the ancient Greeks, giving us the golden mean ratio, the one that you've seen in different art. Theory is that there's this divine ratio of proportions and that certain people, artists, are in tune with it in ways the rest of us aren't. They have a, a heightened connection to the transcendent, the divine. And so they incorporate that divine ratio in the work. Or more recently, some of them are purposely emulating it, adding it to their work deliberately, but not always. It was before the theory was widely known. You still see some artists incorporating that. So you have that idea, that notion that there's something to the patterns in the world at large, that possibly it's a reflection of something bigger, something divine or cosmic. That kind of thinking comes up in films ranging from Aronofsky's Pi. One, mathematics is the language of nature. Two, everything around us can be represented and understood through numbers. Three, if you graph the numbers of any system, patterns emerge. Therefore, there are patterns everywhere in nature to the matrix, to even something more subdued like my dinner with Andre. It also comes up repeatedly in a show like Lost. Bringing it back to the numbers, let me give you two examples from American history where it's possible to conclude that numbers had significance beyond just their materialistic aspects. Oh, this is five, it comes after four, okay. My first example comes from the death of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. When they died, they were hundreds of miles apart, and yet they both died on the same day, within five hours of each other. That day was July 4th, 1826, exactly 50 years from when the Declaration of Independence was signed, that both statesmen who helped found the country, died on the same day, 50 years from the Declaration of Independence, was noted at the time. Commentators saw it as an indication that the hand of providence was smiling on the young nation. You could say that it was just a coincidence, but a notable one nonetheless. My second example is from April 14th, 1865, which was Good Friday that year. It was also the date when Abraham Lincoln was shot by John Wilkes Booth. People of faith interpreted that as Lincoln having a Christ-like 
aspect in his death. In dying, he was able to bring back union and harmony. They interpreted that even back then. So it's possible that certain dates have significance beyond just their material realities. This is Tuesday, it comes after Monday, and this is this day after this one. Not to say we know for sure that's the case, but it's possible. It's happened in the past, it seems. And so it seems possible that kind of thing might happen in our own lives as well. At least if we allow the possibility that we are living in something more than just a material world. All right, now back to the number 23. It has had recurring significance throughout history and in my life as well. I noticed that it was starting to appear in my life, and I wrote about it a little bit on my blog. One of the posts I, I mentioned it, and the Enigma a little bit, the James Dean blog post, a few others. But it started to, to show up more and more in my life. I, I noticed it, key events. A film shoot would be on the 23rd, not because I planned it that way. It's like we were going to shoot a different day, and that's the day that opened up. My grandparents, their anniversary is September 23rd. It has had recurring significance at other key moments of my life, including, yes, a, a crash of sorts. Then I started noticing the number in a number of films and shows, books, albums that I like. It might be confirmation bias. I'm looking for the number. I have an attachment to it at this point, so the numbers would stick out. But still, still, the number does seem to keep showing up in all kinds of ways. And it's had a recurring appearance on my podcast going back months and months at this point. It's been an ongoing streak. I just happened to take note of that one because that was when they first announced Taylor Swift was involved in the film, which relates to this conversation, okay? The numbers, it seems like it's a random string of numbers, right? 3, 20, 3, 20. Except that it happens to be the day when I'm releasing this episode. The time of this recording, if you go to Ralphie May's Facebook page, the Facebook page linked to from the film site, you'll see they have a, a certain post that's pinned. It's about the film. It gives you an overview about the film and his life and so on. That's from uh, September 23rd. The film is screening at the New Orleans Film Festival October 17th and 23rd. I'll be going to the screening on the 23rd because, you know, and if you don't, go back and listen to a couple of other episodes. Maybe you'll figure it out. 23 reviews for Tom's book, The Free State, when I picked it up on Kindle. Table 23 is where the New York critic is sitting in uh, the Christmas episode that I mentioned. Later in that episode, there's a, a New York Giants reference, but you know, whole other thing, we won't go into all of my obsessions. Sir Thomas Mallory is believed to have gone to trial for his misdeeds on uh, August 23rd, 1451. According to the records I've seen online, Hurricane Katrina first formed August 23rd, 2005. She told me that the, the first can market for her company, Bell Epoch Films, happened in May 2015, when she had just turned 23. 23,000 plus likes for Last Bison. It's to the festival. I noticed that right when I finished my press pass application for South by Southwest, it was 1.23 a.m. He mentioned three musicians. Adrian Milu and Jonathan Brooke both have a connection to the number. Adrian was born on December 23rd, Jennifer on January 23rd. And now even the connection experiment, most of them also have a connection to the number, except for the Christmas one, which was uh, a little different because I did that one with my sister. That was sort of an impromptu, like, let's go exploring and see what happens. 
There were so many connections to the number 23 in the Nashville episode that I even put together a montage in that episode. So the number has had a recurring appearance for me. And yes, it showed up in the California trip as well in so many ways. That's my ticket for the flight from New Orleans. This is baggage claim ticket. And no, I didn't request the number. I'm not that crazy. This is uh, when I was going to meet Carlton. This is the magazine I brought with me while waiting for Carlton. I got there a few minutes early because, you know, Los Angeles traffic can be uh, pretty bad. I've been in the past and uh, at one point, when I visited a couple years ago, something that I, I think was supposed to take like 15 minutes ended up taking an hour and a half. So I didn't know what to expect. I came early. I brought a magazine just in case. This is on the first page of that magazine. The number even showed up while I was working on this video. I would put some thoughts together and think, okay, there's a lot of this stuff. I need to take a break. And then, of course, I see it. In, uh, see it on Facebook or in a film I happen to be watching. So it has shown up in all kinds of places. What do you think? All confirmation bias? It did show up in uh, one other place as well. The date when I met Carlton, January 23rd. Now, part of that was me. Initially, I mentioned to him or his team helping to set up the meeting that I was available on, uh, what, the third week of January, partly because it was like, well, Christmas just happened. I, I need to take care of some things in the holidays. I had some plans for the months that followed, so January seemed like it would fit. Th this That week seemed like it would be a good one. And then they narrowed it down to two days, one of them being January 23rd. And then I said, all right, well, let's do January 23rd. Live dangerously, right? Incidentally, January 23rd, 2019 was when I shot much of the first connection experiment. So once again, the narrative circles back. Many times when I'm doing various Creative projects, the early stage has a lot of negativity from me. This is terrible. This is the worst thing. Why are you wasting your time on this? It's going to be embarrassing, humiliating. It's going to be not worth it. It's an unlovable thing. Just like you are. That's the uh, negative voice that I hear in my head sometimes. You I'm trying to love it into existence as I do with so many other creative projects that I, I want to bring to life. Well, I guess now it's time for me to tell you how I got to meet Carlton Cuse. It was through one of those charity auctions, the ones where you bid for the chance to meet a celebrity or dignitary if you get the winning bid. I had seen those kind of things before, but as far as I can recall, that was the first time I participated. In part because I'm a filmmaker, but I'm still trying to get established. And so I'm not at the point where I'm getting buckets of money coming my way. That would be nice. It would make filmmaking a little easier, but not yet. So I'm trying to save some money or buy equipment. But I, I recently got a, a video editing job. I'm a, an editor on a local TV show here in Louisiana, along with some other work that I've been getting. So that helped. I had supplemental income and I could make it work while making a bid for one of these auctions is uh, 
a, a notable investment. It might delay additional equipment that I would get or upgrade. I could make it work. That wasn't why I was hesitant this time. The reason I was hesitant to get involved was because the auction was going towards the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. As someone who is right of center, I have some reservations about the things that they do. All right, I'll tell you. Back when I was in college at Boston University, I was actually the president of the college Republicans. Don't tell anyone, right? Well, now you know. I guess this means I won't be getting the gig to shoot the Bernie Bros band. Oh darn. That said, I have no problem working with partnering with people who see things differently, as long as I'm treated with respect. Similarly, I've had all kinds of people on my show representing diverse outlooks on the world. I don't bring them on because I necessarily agree with all of their outlooks, but because I appreciate their artistic achievements or industry insights. I'm not going to go into all the points of contention I have with the ACLU here, but I do want to give them credit for something. Their commitment to defending American civil liberties extends to protecting the free speech even of white nationalists and other less than desirable groups in our contemporary world. I consider the freedom of speech to be a foundational one, and it's particularly important to defend for those who we may not like. After all, people in power are not exactly inclined to suppress the free speech of those flattering them or agreeing with everything they say. They're more likely to oppose the dissident voices. I'm grateful that the ACLU is defending the free speech of groups I consider unsympathetic or hard to like. They're doing it, so I don't have to. Bring it back to Carlton Cuse, the point, I think, is that he mattered enough to me that I was willing to make a sizable donation to a group I'm apprehensive about. And I can't say that for a lot of people. There are very few people I would consider doing something like that for, and he was one of them. When the bidding for lunch with Carlton opened, I was still hesitant, but two things happened that made me reconsider. The first came from a conversation I had with a screenwriting friend. I help organize the screenwriters down south here in Baton Rouge, and after our monthly meetings, we normally go somewhere nearby to get a bite to eat or some drinks and continue the conversation in a more informal way. After one of our meetings, we went to a bar in Baton Rouge called Hayride Scandal, a prohibition era styled venue that replaced another whiskey bar on the same location called Lock and Key. After some initial small talk and banter about the industry, my friend asked my take about a film he worked on called The Hunt. This was back in the fall of 2019, so there wasn't a great deal out about the film. It had caused some controversy, though, and so I was marginally aware of that. I told him, well, from what I've heard of it, I'm not sure that's the best thing we need right now. Some variation of that. And then he, he tells me the people involved, written by Damon Lindelof, who helped run Lost, as we mentioned before, and Nick Cuse, Carlton Cuse's son. I didn't know that. And then he told me something else. He said, you know, Nick Cuse is a Republican, don't you? 
No, I did not. That was surprising to me. It made me rethink some things. I had assumed that Carlton Cuse might have avoided me at South by Southwest because of my outlook. I, I might have said something that he was apprehensive about. I don't know. But that changed it a little bit. It meant presumably he was open to at least having a conversation with someone named Nick who saw things a little differently than the conventional Hollywood outlook. So that was in the back of my mind. It happened close to around the time when I became aware of the bid. So I thought about it. It was in the back of my mind. Oh, that's interesting. And then there was the day when the, the bidding would end. I hadn't bid yet. I waited. I was still considering. I said, well, I'll think it over. We'll see how things go. And I went for a run that day. I told myself, I'm not going to look at the time when this bidding ends. I know it ends today at some point. I'm going to go for a run and think about it. If it makes sense, after the run, I'll consider. And if there's still time, I might put in a bid. So I went for a run. And while I was running, I was listening to the audiobook of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, book six. I've gone through the books a couple times. This time around, I was going through them again, trying to get a better sense of the structure of the stories. They're remarkably well-structured. J.K. Rowling, of course, an incredible writer, incredible imagination, but the stories are also really well-structured. And I thought it would be helpful to go through each book, and try to figure out what's the dramatic question, how do they develop, and so on. While I was running, I realized the structure. I got a better sense of it. I'd been thinking about it, and so the run reinforced it. You could say book six is essentially structured around this dramatic question. Is someone like Dumbledore foolish for seeing the good in others, even in those who are not easy to like? And in book six, the answer to that seems to be, well, yes, so it would seem. That changes in book seven. And that was significant to me because it related to a question I had about Carlton Cuse and something that I had sent him years ago. It was enough to get me to rethink my position. It was enough to get me open to the possibility of the auction. I came home and I saw the auction was still going, but about two minutes left. And when I saw that, I started to scramble because I didn't know where my wallet was. I was trying to find it. Time was running down. I got the bid in with about a minute or less and it went through. I didn't think I was going to make it in time. I thought time would run out or the, the site would delay or it hadn't been refreshed. I was nervous about that, but then it did. I found out I 
got the winning bid. So that's how that happened. Oh, and this is the email confirming that I won the bid for lunch with Carlton. See any numbers that stick out? Now, you might be wondering what it was I was thinking about in regards to Carlton Cuse. How did that relate to Harry Potter? Well, I'll tell you eventually, but uh, let me now tell you about what happened when we met. So, the day finally came, January 23rd. After all this time, I would finally get to meet Carlton Cuse. Almost 10 years since when I first reached out on Twitter. Most of my time in California prior to that meeting was me working on the Nashville Connection experiment. I was even staying up late to work on it. I did get to see a friend and, uh, you know, meet and greet and so on, but primarily working on the video. And I had stayed up quite late the prior night as well. I got very little sleep on the 22nd going into the 23rd because I was trying to finish that video because it felt like I should. Of all the connection experiment videos, that one, the Nashville one, had the closest resemblance to Lost. Uh, until this video, obviously. But uh, that one involves a plane and competing narratives and so on. The number 23 has its own little montage in that video. So I finished it and uh, had it uploading, taking a while to upload. But I thought, all right, well, maybe it'll finish uploading by the time I get to the restaurant. It did not. It, it took, I think, a day to upload with the, the super slow internet speeds I had. Nice guy, Airbnb host, but uh, he did not mention he had very slow internet. Anyway, I was heading over. I got the lift and I was thinking about what I would say. What would it be like? My contact from the ACLU had mentioned that Carlton had requested no film pitches, understandable. I'm sure he gets inundated with all kinds of ideas. And it really wasn't about that for me anyway. But I was thinking, well, if it goes well, I might make a request, not about a film pitch. I thought maybe, we'll see. But I was nervous, curious, excited, uncertain. All those emotions were going through my head as I tried to figure out what I would say. When I finally arrived at the sushi spot where we would meet, I looked the place over took a few quick shots, and then went to the table that I had reserved. I told you earlier that I had brought along a magazine from the New Orleans Museum of Art. That museum featured prominently in my second connection experiment, and around that time I had become a member. So I thought I could read up on some of the sculptures and art that I had seen. Then I saw the number 23, and that didn't exactly soothe my nerves. I was trying to read, learn about some of the sculptures that I had seen in their sculpture garden, but I couldn't really concentrate. I was thinking about 
what I would say to Carlton. So many things I wanted to say, so many questions I wanted to ask. So eventually I put the magazine away and just took in the surroundings. And then Carlton came. He said hello with a question asking if I was Nick, which was not what I expected. But then my facial features have changed a little bit over the years, especially from when I first contacted him. Uh, no, I didn't have this when we met in person, but I figure that could have been a possibility. He sees all kinds of people. I even speculated about appearances when I wrote the South by Southwest blog post. I said it was possible that uh, uh, he didn't recognize me because I had sunglasses on. My photo was in many of the, the tweets I had sent him. And so I thought he would at least be familiar from me from that. And I hadn't reached out just once or twice. It, again, it's over 57 times by my count. Now, I'm not the expert at connecting with people. I'm still trying. That's one of the reasons I'm doing the show. I want to get better at it. But I have been able to connect with certain prominent people, whether on Twitter or in person. And uh, a number of them have come on my show, some accomplished people who have won uh, Emmys, uh, Oscars, uh, a couple of other accolades. So I thought I had some sense of what it took to get awareness with someone, to build at least recognition. But as the conversation continued, it seemed like he had no awareness of me whatsoever. Ten years of trying to connect because it felt like I should seemingly had no impact whatsoever. That was disorienting to say the least. And um, I did not make any special requests, although I did ask to take a photo and he was nice enough to do the photo with me. Quite proficient at taking photos. I imagine he's taken lots of them, so he was able to get that set quickly. I'm the guy that still fumbles. I, I, I need to practice that a little more. So that happened and I was perplexed. It had gone so very differently than all the different scenarios I had imagined. And uh, after he left, I walked over to Pinkberry right nearby got some frozen yogurt and just sat and tried to make sense of things. It's something I'm still trying to make sense of now. Back then, I was just bewildered, stunned, confused. How was it that I had gotten it so wrong, seemingly? So I came up with a couple of different scenarios. The first possibility came to me while I was having the conversation with Carlton. I was so surprised that he didn't seem to recognize me even after trying to reach out to him 57 plus times on Twitter and the like that I suspected he may not have been telling the whole truth for whatever reason. In retrospect, I'm not as convinced of this possibility. I think it's unlikely. 
he did seem to be telling the truth. I'm not an expert at connection. I have tried to read and learn from those who are more experienced in this, however. And one of the things the experts mention about trying to assess the veracity of others is getting a baseline. So when interrogators are asking questions, they ask neutral questions first, see how the person responds, and then they make reference to more loaded material. So I did a version of that, you could say. I had a conversation, got some introductory comments out and noted the reactions and then mentioned things that might have had significance if Carlton was aware of me in some way. I didn't detect even the smallest, most subtle of micro expressions to suggest that there was something contradictory in conflict with what he was saying and suggesting. So if he wasn't being entirely honest, then that would be what seems to me weapons grade level of diplomacy and or poker skills. It's possible. He does work with some of the most accomplished actors in the world running the shows that he does. And he's done some dramatic things as well, whether the presentations he does or introducing some of the shows and so on. And I guess you could say that preserving the secrets of a show, keeping them quiet until the right time, might be comparable to defending state secrets. Still, I'm not convinced. It did seem like he was telling the truth and was surprised by some of the things I said. Nonetheless, it was one possibility I thought of early on. Now, I think other possibilities are more likely. So that brings me to the second possibility. That would be that I am delusional. I didn't get it quite right. It was all in my imagination. This seems like a reasonable conclusion. I mentioned that I'm not always great at connection. Sometimes I get it wrong. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this series to get better at connecting. So I'm not always getting it right, have it in the past, and uh, it's an area I'm working on. So there's that. I am someone who is trying to make things work. I right? So I might have an overactive imagination and uh, possibly I'm reading into things as a kind of wishful thinking. Okay, that's a distinct possibility, I will acknowledge. Actually, something that came up in conversation with Carlton relates to this possibility. When I got the sense that Carlton didn't recognize me, I was surprised. I was trying to find something to talk about. We mentioned LSU briefly. That was one of the things I put in a little background information. And I was trying to find something to regain composure. I had a sense that I was possibly even making him feel uncomfortable. All right, great. That, that's actually one of my fears, that I try to connect with someone and it falls apart in an embarrassing way that leaves both sides uncomfortable. That's a fear of mine. That actually happened in an earlier connection experiment. Episode two, the New Orleans Art Museum. I talk about that a bit. So I was trying to find some kind of common ground. 
we talked about Lost and the podcast he did. And I mentioned I had a podcast. And uh, somehow we got to talking about Malcolm Gladwell. I think it was in context to his masterclass. Masterclass is a sponsor for the show, and I had seen that one recently. And Carlton took interest in his book. So that was one I had heard recently, Talking to Strangers. And we talked about that a bit. Incidentally, I had the chance to meet Malcolm Gladwell at South by Southwest 2019. I talked to him after a screening for a film that he was a part of. And uh, I didn't have a lot of time. It's one of those other people are there trying to say hello. And so I said hello. I, I mentioned that I was doing press coverage at South by Southwest and then mentioned, hey, I saw that you have a new book coming up, Talking to Strangers. Well, how do you feel about talking to this stranger? Not, not the best pitch, but, you know, I had a limited amount of time. All right, come on, give me a break. But had I read the book at the time, it wasn't out then. I've since read it. But had I read the book then, I would have probably realized that's not the best approach for that situation because one of Malcolm Gladwell's main points in his book is that other people are not easy. It's not easy to understand them. Misunderstandings can and do come up based on limited perceptions and false assumptions. If only I had read the book more carefully the first time around, I might have been better prepared for my conversation with Carlton. In retrospect, I was acting on a couple of assumptions that may not have been true or entirely precise. For example, I had seen Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof post things on Twitter. Damon, at the time, had been more prone to interact directly with others, occasionally replying to someone's comments, sharing posts from others, and so on. Carlton Cuse seems to have a more reserved approach, but at the time, I assumed that they acted in similar ways. It's also quite possible that Carlton Cuse has someone who posts on his behalf as a number of prominent celebrities and dignitaries do, or that he gets so many messages on a daily basis, hundreds or more, that he's not aware of those people who are sending him messages on Twitter. That does make sense. Similarly, at South by Southwest, the environment, while confined, did not necessarily mean that he saw me, acknowledged me, and chose not to say hello. It may have just been a matter of limited time constraints and that he had to leave because he had a busy schedule. And if he hadn't seen me on Twitter, then he wouldn't have recognized me. Okay. Valid points. As Malcolm Gladwell mentions in his book, even the experts get fooled by people. Experienced Wall Street traders got fooled by Bernie Madoff, and the CIA was fooled by Castro's double agent operatives for over 10 years. Presumably the people who work for the CIA are some of the best in the world at deciphering communication, parsing truth from falsehood. They would need to be. Their job depends on it. That could literally be life and death by orders of magnitude. So it's notable that even they get fooled sometimes. Reading that, again, when I revisited the book after the conversation with Carlton, made me feel a little better. I may have gotten it wrong, 
quite wrong, but it happens. And even some of the best in the world do similar things sometimes. The second possibility that I got it entirely wrong, that it was all based on false assumptions from my limited perspective, does explain a lot, but it doesn't explain everything. Why did the numbers keep showing up? Why did I have a sense that I should do so many things? Why did the timing work out in uncanny ways at times? So that brings up possibility number three, which I'll call Hamlet's Dilemma. In Shakespeare's Hamlet, considered by many to be one of the best plays ever written, there's some ambiguity about what drives Hamlet. Is he just acting out of madness, a desire for revenge, or acting on behalf of his ghost father? Or is he under the influence of a more malevolent spirit? We're not sure exactly. There is the ghost that shows up. At first, it's seen by others. Later in the play, interestingly enough, Hamlet sees it. His mother doesn't. Suggesting perhaps something's going on with his perception of reality or with the ghost. And when the ghost comes, there's this repeated questioning about it. Hamlet himself is unsure about the ghost's identity. He says to it, be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. He's unsure. Is it his dad? Is he going crazy? Or is it something in the form of his dad? Interesting for us to consider, worth pointing out as well, that the play begins with the question, who's there? Might make a difference ghost or something more sinister. If Hamlet's merely carrying out the wishes of his dead father, and that turns tragic, well, it's complicated, but I mean, the son's got to do what he can. It seems honorable enough. What if he was manipulated, though? Interestingly enough, Hamlet has suicidal thoughts before he sees the ghost. And his friends are warning him, don't talk to the ghost. Don't do it. It's going to put crazy thoughts in your head. It's going to make you suicidal. And Hamlet doesn't exactly run away. Oh, um, hmm. Well, I was already kind of thinking about that anyway. Let's see what this fellow has to say. At this point, I should mention that in spite of Hamlet's erratic, sometimes unhinged behavior, I still find him to be a sympathetic character. After all, he had lost his dad just a few weeks ago, and then within that time, discovered that his mom was marrying his dad's brother. Not a lot of time passed between that happening. Several years ago, my dad got a brain aneurysm unexpectedly. And then shortly thereafter, he passed away. And that was one of the most destabilizing times, if not the most destabilizing time in my life. It stung because it felt like we were improving our relationship, that it was almost right. And um, we were working on it, but it wasn't quite where I hoped it would be. And uh, so that, 
That made it uh, uh, a little more difficult. So, if I had seen a, a specter of someone resembling my dad making unusual requests of me, I would at least be open to hearing what that entity had to say. So I'm not uh, entirely unsympathetic to Hamlet, although I note that some of his actions are suspect and led to unfortunate results. Anyway, Hamlet himself is so unsure about who he's dealing with and what he should do that he hesitates. And one of the things he decides to do is to get some actors to put on a scene at the court where a king is murdered. And he says, well, I'm going to watch and see how the king reacts. And this will help Hamlet, he thinks, determine what to do. Just because the king is reacting doesn't mean it necessarily means that he's guilty of everything that Hamlet concludes. I mean, he, he might just be reacting to the scene of a king getting killed or to the way that his nephew is seemingly acting in more and more unhinged ways in public and with all kinds of people. King Claudius does seem to show some guilt when we see him in the play, but we're not exactly sure as to why or what actually happened. We are told by the ghost, remember the ghost that the friends are saying, don't listen to the ghost, he's gonna fill your head with crazy thoughts. That ghost is the one that tells us Claudius killed Hamlet's dad by pouring poison in his ear. Well, I mean, if the ghost tells us, that's reliable of a source as any, right? Notable that the ghost mentions poison through the ear, because that's kind of sort of what the ghost is doing to Hamlet, poisoning his mind with the things he whispers to him. There is the suggestion in the play that the king might have been involved in the death of his brother, but we're not sure exactly how. What if it was uh, an accident? Kind of like Hamlet accidentally killing Polonius. He thought it was someone else. He's in the midst of angrily berating his mother, and then something happens behind the curtains and he stabs it thinking it may have been the king, and he's angry and he's gonna get revenge. Oh, well, it's just that annoying old man giving him a hard time. Well, can't let that get in the way of berating mother. But that sets in motion Laertes, seeking revenge on Hamlet, just like Hamlet is seeking revenge on Claudius. So there is some uncertainty about what happened exactly. So much of Hamlet involves making assumptions based on the appearances of things. The ghost seems to have the appearance of a Hamlet's dad. Claudius seems to be acting in a guilty way when he is caught in certain situations, and so on. Making assumptions based strictly on the appearance of things is something that Malcolm Gladwell cautions us against in talking to strangers. The things that we think and feel are not always accurately reflected by the way we present ourselves to the world. In the book, he uses the TV show Friends as an example. Friends match perfectly. They are trained actors, and so when there are moments of surprise, the actors accurately portray surprise. Same with fear, joy, all the different affections. 
Not so with everyone. Most of us don't have full transparency between the things we think and feel and the way that we express ourselves publicly. We're not all trained actors. So there's incongruity. In the book, Malcolm Gladwell uses Amanda Knox as an example. She was assumed to be guilty by the Italian authorities because she didn't act like what they expected an innocent girl to act like. And so they assumed she was guilty, but she has a mismatch, according to Malcolm Gladwell. She's an innocent girl who seems guilty because she's a quirky girl living in a foreign land, reacting to something unexpected. The play Hamlet might be illustrating Malcolm Gladwell's notion of being mismatched. We don't know for sure, but it might. Another dramatic illustration of that is Better Call Saul season four. There's an incident that happens to the character who becomes Saul. Jimmy McGill is his name in the early days before he comes Saul from Breaking Bad. Uh, there's an incident, and uh, he reacts one way because it's complicated. And that's not the reaction that people wanted, and that affects him. So later, he comes back, and he reacts in a calculated way. Not exactly how he feels, not true to life, but it's more in keeping with expectations. Yeah. Better Call Saul, interesting show. It's not just Breaking Bad the early years, kind of is, but you have a character who in Breaking Bad is kind of a, a flat character. He's comical in his ways of being corrupt. In Better Call Saul, he's actually someone trying to be a decent guy. You see that he is uh, occasionally prone to manipulate, to take the easy way out, but he's genuinely trying to be a, a decent guy. And that struggle becomes more apparent in season four, which does incidentally involve Louisiana and the number 23. So there's a connection there as well, possibly. Who knows? Season five, incidentally, premiered on February 23rd of this year. So uh, perhaps the number is not always uh, benevolent. Maybe it's complicated. Tis very strange, as Hamlet might say. Now, I haven't seen season five, so I don't know what's in store for Jimmy McGill, but the show does make me wonder if there was ever a point when things could have changed, if certain events had gone even a little differently, if certain relationships had progressed in slightly different ways. Would that have been a factor? Would that have been enough to turn things around. Makes you wonder, right? I wonder the same thing about Hamlet. Was there ever a point in his story where the tragedy could have turned into a comedy, one complete with a happy ending? Or were the dissonant forces set in motion at the beginning too strong to overcome? Well, that's enough speculation for now. Let's get back to Hamlet's dilemma. He was unsure about who was influencing or what was influencing him. Before encountering the ghost, he had a death wish. He encounters the ghost, whatever it is. And then by the end, he dies. His ex-girlfriend commits suicide, death, is spread throughout the kingdom. So in a sense, he got his wish. His death wish came true by listening to the ghost. 
which indicates in a dramatic way that it's hard for us to know exactly what it is that influences us or why we do the things we do. Is it just us reacting to things that hurt, growing mad, becoming delusional? Or are we being influenced by others, other forces, sometimes supernatural forces for good or evil? It's unclear, at least in Hamlet. Now, that talk of supernatural influence might sound kind of out there. We are more sophisticated. We're a rational age. We believe in science and all that. But a number of thinkers, including literary heavyweights like C.S. Lewis and Norman Mailer, gave serious credence to the possibility that there is supernatural influence, even in the seeming day-to-day -day moments of our lives. Even Carlton Cuse seems open to the possibility of supernatural influences at work in our lives, at least in his shows like Lost or Lock and Key, which premiered recently on Netflix. Speaking of taking the appearance of things, that was also something that the smoke monster, aka the man in black on Lost, was known to do. Dad? Also, there's a reference to Hamlet's speech specifically the undiscovered country part of his to be or not to be soliloquy in the Hanso Foundation's page. This is part of the alternate reality game that expands the lost universe. Haven't had a chance to explore all that. I go into some deep dives, but not all of them, okay? So thanks to Lostpedia for making me aware of this connection. Also, the founder of the Hanso Foundation, the entity responsible for the Dharma Initiative in Lost, is Danish, just like Hamlet. This brings up an interesting question. Is the ghost in Hamlet actually the man in black from Lost? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so, but uh, who knows? Probably not. Probably not, but I mean, could be, could, uh, probably isn't. All right, I was kidding around just then, but I was trying to make an important point. We can never be entirely sure why we do the things we do. Are we always acting on our own accord or are we under the influence of something or someone? It's hard to say sometimes. So it can help to evaluate the consequences or potential consequences of our actions. If they lead to death and decay for the entire kingdom, that might be reason enough for us to be wary about our own motivations. So what were the consequences of me meeting with Carlton? That's complicated. I'll expand on that in a bit, but one obvious change involves alcohol. I mentioned earlier that I hadn't been drinking for several weeks. After meeting with Carlton, I had a couple of drinks that night, and I've had a couple of drinks every couple of days since then. My inclination to drink more isn't the only consequence that came from the meeting with Carlton. I've also found myself more hesitant to be generous, to, to give to others. I, I had prayed about it, about the meeting. 
that's not to say I got it right, but I did pray, mm. reflect, mm. talk to people indirectly. And so one of the things I wrote down when reflecting is if, if this goes badly, it's going to be a little harder for me to donate to others. I'm not sure it went badly, but um, that was the reaction it had on me nonetheless. I haven't entirely stopped giving. I mean, with the crisis at hand, people were hurting more so than I was. So I couldn't entirely overlook that. So it wasn't like it was a complete 180 change, but it was something that affected me that will probably still affect me for some time as I try to make sense of it all. I, I have to acknowledge too that after the meeting, it hasn't been as easy to do the right thing. I've still tried, I continue to try, but sometimes I falter. I'm not sure if you know what it's like to strive for something. For years, even 10 years or more, and to have it fall apart. Uh, it was destabilizing. And it's not just Carlton, although you could say that he represents both personal and professional aspirations me trying to make things work in those areas, whether to find a, a friend or a mentor or to build a career in Hollywood in the entertainment industry. Those relate to meeting with Carlton and um, I, I've been trying on both of those fronts for a while, and it seems like, like I haven't made the progress that I had hoped. So all that to say, when, when you have an incident like meeting with Carlton that, at least in my mind, gets tied up with those kind of big picture aspirations, it, it does it does have an influence. It did weigh on me. I'm, I'm trying not to let that happen. But I, I don't always get it right. And um, sometimes the, the things that happen affect the way I engage the world. Before the trip to California, when I was preparing to meet with Carlton, I started going back and re-watching some of the episodes of Lost. I had seen it all the way through, but again, the, the show had ended 10 years ago. And so it had been a while. So I thought, you know what, I'll go back and re-watch them. Lost is really well written, episode by episode, but also it's well structured throughout, it seems. And so it's a good learning exercise, for sure. If you're interested in learning more about storytelling, dramatic tension, episodic writing, and so on, there are worse things to do than to, to study law. So in, in that sense, it was beneficial, right? But I also thought, well, I'm going to go and, and say hello to him if the show is a little more present in my mind, that might help with small talk. It might make the connection go a little better. Who knows? And uh, I was chugging along watching a number of the episodes on Hulu, 
And then I came to Deus Ex Machina, episode 19, season 1. Written by Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof. And uh, that slowed down my ability to, to watch more of the episodes. I did watch more of them eventually. But that one put a halt to it for a bit. Because in that one, John Locke is remembering some things from his past. He was someone who grew up without the influence of a mom and dad. And then one day his mom shows up and then his dad. And he seems to think it's a sign. It was meant to be. His dad befriends him. And you see just how much it means to John to have the, the approval of his dad. Got him. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Good shot, son. And then as the episode develops, you learn that was just a trick. His dad was running a long con to get John to donate one of his kidneys. And when John donates the kidney, the dad doesn't want to have anything to do with John. So that, that struck a nerve. I had forgotten about that episode. That episode affected me. It has a, a powerful reversal, so that's good drama for you, but there was that apprehension. What if trying to meet Carlton is sort of like that? What if I'm being tricked somehow into donating to the ACLU and the meeting ends up being like that. So, needless to say, I was a little hesitant to watch more episodes of Lost at that point. And I thought it had to be a Greek tie-in, didn't it? Deus Ex Machina, the title of the episode, comes from ancient Greek drama. I'm Greek, I take note of these things. It's God from the machine, essentially. Because back then, ancient Greek drama, they would use machines to bring the gods, you know, have them seemingly float onto the stage. Dramatically, as you probably know, that means when the gods come in at the very end to solve something, to solve the dilemma of the play. And some critics frown on that. They say it's a cheat. But uh, it's only a cheat if you don't believe in God or your story doesn't allow for the divine. Around that time, I, I took a break from watching Lost and thinking about that kind of thing. And uh, I was listening to some music. I want to say it was uh, YouTube Music. And I was trying one of their recommended playlists for me just to see what would come up. The first song that came up was Diary of Jane by Breaking Benjamin, a song that I hadn't heard before, but uh, eh, it related. It's a song about someone being desperate to make things work, but there's no love in that situation. But then the song that came right after that was Story by Brandy Carlisle. Brandy Carlisle has special significance to me. I won't go into all that here. I talk a little bit about it in the Bluebird podcast episode commentary. 
So give that a listen if you want even more of the rabbit hole. But that's a song about purpose and meaning. So in a way, they were juxtaposing two competing ideas. No love, no meaning, no purpose. Anger to a song that, that's taking a different position. Everything is about love. It all leads to this. So that, that helped a little bit. Um, actually, I think that may have been an influence in the bit I did in the Nashville Connection experiment where I talk about the two competing narratives at the film festival, and I use two songs to mention that narrative. So that may have been an influence, and I was working on that Nashville Connection experiment up until when I met Carlton, much of that time being at Starbucks. So, it's complicated. To be clear, at our lunch meeting, Carlton Cuse struck me as being thoughtful, curious, and committed to excellence. If the scenario in Deus Ex Machina relates in any way, then the part of John Locke's dad wouldn't be played by him, but by me. The part of me that's wary of my filmmaking aspirations and wants me to do anything but that. Or perhaps some unseen specter that's whispering in my ear. If it's a possibility for Hamlet, it might be a possibility for any of us, right? Whatever the case may be, pursuing a film career has not come without heartaches. There have been good moments when things have worked out, and those moments have kept me going. But things don't always work out. Sometimes it still feels like filmmaking is the right path for me. It feels like something I should do. But then there's another part of me that tries to undermine that, that wants me to do anything but that. Assuming that we're not always consciously aware of all the reasons why we do the things we do, it's possible that side of me would encourage having a meeting with someone like Carlton Cuse. If that meant donating to a cause I was apprehensive about, especially if there was a decent chance that it would go badly. And thus crippling future film pursuits. What can I say? Parsing motivation is complicated because we're complicated. Psychologist Carl Jung refers to the shadow side in each person. In Christian terms, that might get described as the old sin nature or the fallen man. However we're describing it, I acknowledge there is that part of me with which I must contend, that does try to undermine my hopes and dreams. Sometimes it even exerts its influence on my creative endeavors. Quite possibly, that side of me wanted things to go badly. But I'm not sure that things did go badly. I'm not entirely sure that it was a mistake to go, that it has brought nothing but bad things. Because what happened afterwards was complicated, complicated enough for me to make this video. Here's the thing, Lost itself acknowledges that there are bad people out there, liars, manipulators, con men, murderers, situations where there is no love, but it doesn't suggest that's all there is in the way that a David Mamet film might. It offers a competing narrative, another side, one that 
suggests there might be purpose, there might be connection, there might be something transcendent. Not unlike the tension between Diary of Jane and Story from Brandy Carlyle. In fact, there are moments of Lost that help me process what it was like to meet with Carlton. John Locke, our friend who gave his kidney to an ungrateful dad, is having a crisis of faith. This is season two, episode 23, Live Together, Die Alone. And on the night that he died for nothing, I was sitting right up there, all alone, beating my hand bloody against that stupid door, screaming to the heavens, asking what I should do. And then a light went on. I thought it was a sign. But it wasn't a sign. Probably just you going to the bathroom. So the show is acknowledging that it can hurt in very real ways when we look for purpose and meaning and connection and uh, don't find it or have it unfold in ways that we didn't expect. But that's not the end of John Locke's story in that episode or in the show. In the episode, he has a sense of faith restored by some of the things that he encounters. And uh, later in the show, well, I mean, you have to watch it yourself. I can't go into all of Lost in this little video. That brings me to the fourth possibility of trying to explain what happened, which I'm calling the Harry Potter conundrum. As it happens, there's a passing reference to Harry Potter on the Deus Ex Machina episode, but that's not why I'm picking it here. In books six and seven of the Harry Potter series, we discover that Harry Potter may not have been told the whole truth because Dumbledore wasn't sure if he could go through with what needed to be done if he knew the whole story from the beginning. Before going further, I should mention that while I admire Harry Potter, the character in the series with whom I most identify is Severus Snape, the misunderstood misfit trying to make things right, but not always succeeding. His character arc throughout the series is one that I find particularly moving. It's a whole other story. That said, I do relate to Harry Potter's conundrum about what Dumbledore told him. At first, he's angry. Why didn't Dumbledore tell him more? He wanted to know. He wanted to get the big picture. But then Harry Potter acknowledges, had he known the whole story, would he have gone through with it? Would he have been able to do that at an early age? Maybe not. As much as I'm hesitant to acknowledge it here, I will admit that's one possible way to interpret the situation. Had I known what I know today, that I had spent years of my life, almost 10 years, trying to get in touch with Carlton, believing that I should, believing it was something I was supposed to do, even though it was at times anguishing and uncomfortable. And yet doing so had not seemingly made a difference because he was seemingly not aware of me even after 10 years 
of trying to get in touch? Would I still have tried to meet with him? Would I still have made a donation to an organization I was apprehensive about? I'm not sure. I don't think so. And yet, now that I'm here, I'm not entirely sure that it was a mistake. Perhaps, even though I am hesitant to acknowledge it as much, it was something I needed to do. So that I could make this video or for whatever reason, I don't know. I mentioned earlier that the dramatic question of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince seems to be something like, is Dumbledore foolish for trying to see the good in others, even those who are hard to like, even those like Draco Malfoy or Severus Snape, who've given reasons not to see that in them. And book six ends with the suggestion, so it would seem. That's what we're left thinking as the book concludes. But then book seven comes along and you realize, well, maybe it's more complicated. Maybe there's more to the story than what I thought at first. I might have to reconsider my assumptions. I didn't explain back then how that related to me. I will attempt to do that here. One of the big unresolved questions I have in my life relates to Carlton Cuse. Specifically, I wonder from time to time why I felt inclined to send him this on Twitter. That was back in November 2011, before I tried to meet him at South by Southwest. As far as I can recall, I've never said that kind of thing to anyone else. Certainly not a public figure who I had never met in person. Why? Did I feel compelled to say that to Carlton Cuse? To this day, I'm still not sure. But I can say at the time, it felt right. It felt like it was something I was supposed to do. And it wasn't something I did easily. It took a number of coincidences or serendipitous moments, conversations with people I trust, coincidences, signs, what have you. It took a lot to get me to that point. And uh, even to this day, I can't quite understand why. Days turned to weeks, and I didn't hear back. Not much in my situation changed. If anything, things seemed to be getting worse. So doubt 
flooded my mind. Why did I send that? What was I thinking? Why am I still leaving that out there? So, after a few weeks where I heard nothing, I uh, ended up deleting those tweets and a number of others. That's why I'm not sure exactly how many times I've reached out to Carlton because many of my tweets to him have now been deleted. Before I deleted many of them, I did save them to Evernote. So I have the Evernote file of them and what you're seeing Many of those are saved from Evernote. Because the thinking was, well, I need to remember just in case I have a crazy inclination to try to reach out again. And then I should revisit these things and not do that. I had forgotten about some of that when I decided to do the bid to get lunch with Carlton. Now, this is a lot to take in. I acknowledge that. If I were watching this, I would be a little skeptical. But I've tried to be as honest as I could throughout this video. And what's more, I've tried to be as honest as I could throughout my podcast. You can go and listen to the episodes. I've been doing the show for several years now. And you can decide for yourself if you believe me, if you believe that I am trying to aim for honesty. It's what I do. I can say with an open heart and without any reservation that I have try to be as honest as I could in doing the show. I have been aiming for honesty throughout. And I can't think of a single episode where I can say I was not honest in this episode. I may not have uh, brought forward all of my reservations if I did have reservations about a particular topic, but I didn't pretend to embrace something when I was apprehensive. Quite often, I acknowledged my apprehensions, even when that meant acknowledging something that would make the guest more hesitant to share the episode. So, I hope that is readily apparent in all the episodes I've done, but that's not for me to say. You can listen and make your own conclusions. But I can say with an open heart that I have done my very best to be as honest as I can be in my podcast and in these videos I'm sharing with you. In case it isn't clear by now, I don't consider that the same as saying I got everything right. I've been talking about Malcolm Gladwell's book, Talking to Strangers, and a big part of that is that we sometimes get it wrong. The assumptions we make, the perceptions we have, influence the way that we interact with others, and that can skew things. So best be aware of that. I acknowledge as much. I acknowledge my perspective might be limited and I might not get it right all the time. Still, I am trying to do that. After my lunch with Carlton, when I went to Pinkberry to reflect, I was willing to accept the possibility that I was utterly, totally wrong. Everything was just my false perception of things. But then some things happened afterwards, and I'm trying to bring those things into account. Later that day, 
I met with my friend, actor Andrew Vogel, and we met at a place he recommended, Brewport Tap House in El Segundo. I was under the impression that it was going to be just another tap house where you have several beers on draft. But then I noticed the decor. Plain elements. Now, I don't want to read into anything right away. I mean, that could mean anything. Traveling, plain references. That could be a nod to so many things. Aladdin, let's say. Hey there, how's it going? Magic carpet ride going place to place. Okay. Mad Men, yes. Peggy has that one episode where she goes traveling and it's a whole new experience. She's on a plane and it's it's wild and brand new. Or Breaking Bad. There's that one episode where the plane crashes and uh, Walter White and the community react. Or possibly it could call to mind a show where almost every single episode makes reference to a plane crash, like, say, Lost. I didn't tell Andrew that I was going to meet with Carlton Cuse. I told him when we met, but not before. He picked it. Andrew was actually in a short film I directed called Trent's War. He played Trent, a soldier battling PTSD. And in that film, I included a nod to Lost, although I didn't tell the team about it. It was just something I put in for me, but it related to the story. So I told Andrew about it that night. Like, by the way, that sign... That poster that he has framed in his house, that was my little nod to Lost. I... I kind of lost my way for a bit. In case it matters. A guy named Trent's trying to find his way back home. While hanging out with Andrew, I got to meet some of the people nearby. One of the gals at the bar was Raquel. Then she told me that she's 23 and she sometimes wrestles with what it means to take care of her dying dad as opposed to trying to live her life. And while we were hanging out at the bar, I met the bartender, who happens to also be named Nick. Maybe another coincidence. Who knows? You tell me. But I took note. The next day, I went to Disneyland trying to make sense of what happened. A fitting place because... Initially, Carlton and I were supposed to meet on the Disney lot, but a complication came up and we had to change locations. I walked around wondering why I had felt like I was supposed to come. Why? What was the reason for the trip? Why did things unfold like they did? These are some of the questions that were in the back of my mind as I wandered around the park. There are worse places to do that than Disneyland, at least for me. The classic Disney animated films were a big part of why I wanted to go into filmmaking, and they still mean a lot to me. Disneyland is also filled with so many things that have a special place in my heart. Here's a scene from Disney's Princess and the Frog in one of the Emporium windows. That film is set in New Orleans, and that was one of the key influences for me to move to Louisiana. And I'm not even kidding about that. 
Here's me posing with my Ilya Kazan shirt by the Walt Disney statue. It's my way of saying that I'm influenced both by the acclaimed Greek director who helped found the actor's studio, earned Marlon Brando his first Oscar, and has been influential to so many filmmakers like, say, Martin Scorsese. But I'm also influenced by Walt Disney, the man and the company that has brought so much joy, warmth, and enchantment to millions of people. As I walked around the park, I wondered if we are drawn to places like Disneyland and to stories like Lost and Harry Potter because our lives are essentially meaningless and full of suffering, and so we're drawn to elaborate, ornate distractions. That's in keeping with what philosopher Jean Baudrillard would suggest. It's all simulations and simulacra, to paraphrase his essay. Or is it possible that places like Disneyland, stories like Lost, resonate with us because they reveal a greater truth about the world at large. A world filled with purpose, enchantment, even love. It's just some of us have forgotten that as we've gotten hurt and distracted by the world at large. Dearest Des, I'm writing this letter to you as you leave for prison, and I've hidden it in the one place you would turn to in a moment of great desperation. I know you go away with the weight of what happened on your shoulders, and I know the only person who can ever take it off is you. Please don't give up, Des, because all we really need to survive is one person who truly loves us. And you have her. I will wait for you always. I love you. Pen. These were some of the things I was wondering as I walked through Disneyland alone. Like I was at the start of my connection experiment videos. Like I've been for much of my life. I had actually mentioned that I was going to Disneyland to a couple of friends, but uh, they thought it was lame, or it may have just been a, a cost issue. Who knows? In any case, I was there alone. Nonetheless, I couldn't help but be moved by the ideals, the earnestness of the place, the way it seems to bring genuine happiness to so many people. All that to say, I came, I saw, I got the t-shirt. Wait, not that shirt. It's this one. Sorry, it's a little tight. This is the only white area in the house, so. Yeah, I got the sweatshirt. It was my way of acknowledging that I want to be a part of the vision of the place. And I wasn't alone the entire time. I did get to meet some people there while at Disney. Hey! It was so nice meeting you at Disney. Wait, wait, what's your name? I'm David. Brittany Ann. This is Brittany Ann. This is my wife. My name is David. Then I asked Brittany Ann and David to tell me a little bit more about their Instagram channel that they had been telling me about. Drazing.arrows underscore, and it's just like a lifestyle family. We go over the ups and downs of parenthood and wellness and marriage and just everything in between. After that, I asked them if they had been on the ride before. Can I share our first time? Yeah. We have land passes, but we always come with the kids. So now we're here alone on date night. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, have fun, guys. Thanks for Thank chatting. You. They really do have a beautiful Instagram page, a testament to what the Disney vision can look like for a family. After all, Walt Disney was inspired to make Disneyland after watching his daughters on a carousel. 
the philosopher Baudrillard might write acclaimed essays that get applause from academics and that help to influence the Matrix. But I think he got it wrong about Disneyland. He missed a lot of the heart. I started this video talking about rabbits, so I thought I'd include this photo from Brittany Ann and David's Instagram page. I met them while waiting in line for Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run. While waiting in line before the ride starts, you actually get to walk around in a life-size replica of the Millennium Falcon, which includes a hollow game table. The ride is a Star Wars ride set inside the Millennium Falcon, so that already makes it cool. But another unique aspect of it is that you are working as a team with your fellow guests. You get assigned different positions, and depending on how you do, reacting to the ride determines whether you have a totally righteous smuggler's run or, you know, semi-righteous, I mean, you know, gray areas of the law and whatnot, but you're warding off the forces of evil that want to stop you as a team. These were the guys on my team. Thanks for being pilot. And we did all right. We succeeded. We hit a few things, but we got through. They told me that sometimes you can do badly enough that you don't succeed on the mission. So they did a pretty solid job shooting down the TIE fighters. I got to be the pilot. I wasn't shooting down TIE fighters, but I did get to do this. All right, uh, that's enough dancing. I'm sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you've seen prior episodes of the show, you know it's normally a very respectable, dance-free show. So... Where was I again? Bringing gravitas to weighty philosophical questions. And finally finishing this very long video. <laughs> so let's get to it. If you want to see or be reminded of the grand vision of what America is and can be, there are worse ways to go than Walt Disneyland. This is accented in great moments with Mr. Lincoln, where there are statues dedicated to the various spirits of the country, exploration, imagination, and so on. Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln is right by the entrance, and I don't think that's by accident. I think it is a testament to what is at the heart of the place. I know there is a God, and he hates injustice and slavery. One of the many quotes from Abraham Lincoln that we encounter at the exhibit. I'm sorry, I just don't see that kind of thing as escapism in the way that some of the Disney critics suggest. I see that as a vision of better things grounded in a transcendent faith. Abraham Lincoln had it. Walt Disney admired it. And Lost sometimes reminds us of it. Eventually the night came to an end and it was time to head back to the place I was staying. There was so much to see even on the way out. I was really fortunate to get Brian as my Lyft driver because he had worked at Disneyland for several years and he was able to share some insider information with me. One example being that the Abraham Lincoln animatronic is the second one that they replace as technology improves. The first one is the auctioneer at Pirates of the Caribbean. That way they can test it out and uh, do the upgrades and tweaks, and then make them available on one of their showpiece animatronics, Abraham Lincoln. 
He also told me about Club 33, an exclusive venue at Disneyland where you have to be a member to get in and membership costs several thousand dollars a year, like 10 grand plus. Still, it's booked for months and months in advance. It's one of the only places you can drink alcohol at the park, so there's that. Now, with the new Star Wars Cantina, you can also get a couple drinks there as well. Good to know. Thanks, Brian. I asked him a little bit more about his time at Disneyland, how long he'd been working and so on. He told me he had been working there for much of his professional life until he was 23. The next day was my flight back home, and I had a connecting flight from Burbank to Chicago, which happened to be flight 2923. On that flight, I met a lawyer who defends doctors against malpractice. He was heading to Nashville. That was notable to me because my first visit to Nashville was on a road trip I went with my sister where we also went to Chicago. Also, my dad was a doctor, an oncologist, and he would tell me sometimes about the pressure that doctors faced from malpractice suits, sometimes frivolous one. So I was glad to meet a thoughtful, seemingly decent lawyer who was interested in defending doctors against those kind of cases. When I landed in Chicago, I had some time before my connecting flight to New Orleans. So I went exploring and came across Harry Carey's Shortstop, a bar themed after the late broadcaster announcer of the Chicago Cubs. He was someone I became more aware of when I went to Chicago with my sister. We got to do a tour of Wrigley Field and uh, talking to people in town, you hear about the esteem that the community had for him. Once again, just like at the beginning of the trip, I had a sense that I should stop and visit the bar. This time, though, I determined if I were to sit down, I'd have at least a beer or two. It had been quite a trip. Still, the sense persisted. Sitting next to me was Jeff, who helps doctors get insurance coverage against malpractice. Not only did his line of work connect with the gentleman I had met on the prior flight, but also to my dad. We talked about baseball. It turns out Jeff has some memorabilia related to Harry Carey, but somehow we also got onto Harry Potter. In this case, how the studios claim to have lost money on some of the films at least, but they still made so many Harry Potter films. It happens, but the connection was there nonetheless. Jeff also shared some insights about life and love. And then somehow we got to talking about our dads. And I mentioned to him how hard it was when my dad passed away. Talking to strangers about the death of my dad is not something I normally do. So some of that may have been the alcohol talking but some of it may have also been influence from the days before. More than many shows, Lost acknowledges the impact that someone's relationship with a dad can have in good and bad ways. There's even an episode of Lost that acknowledges as much in the title. It's called, All the Best Cowboys Have Daddy Issues. There was also the book, Not Forsaken, which I had been reading while on the California trip. The book was a gift to me from my cousin. He sent it to me after one of our conversations turned spiritual, and I was expressing doubts about some things. The book looks at how the love 
of a heavenly father, a perfect father, can correct, make amends for the shortcomings and aches from our fathers here on earth. Incidentally, my cousin's name is also Nick. Now, at this point, there have been a number of coincidences that seem to connect. If this were a fictional story, that might strain credulity. But sometimes reality is stranger than fiction, at least in my life. Stranger Than Fiction, the film starring Will Ferrell, is one of my favorites. And there's a connection to the number 23 in that as well. I actually had one of the producers from that film, Lindsay Duran, on my podcast. So check the show notes for that. As to my cousin's name, there's no big mystery there. We're both named after our granddad, something not terribly unusual in Greek culture. As to the other connections, though, well, that I don't know. I'm recording these comments in April 2020 after I've had several weeks to reflect on what happened. And I still don't know what to make of it all. Was it all just a bunch of coincidences? It may have been, but then I can't think of another instance in my life where so much has seemed to interconnect in hard to explain ways. Speaking of Lost, I even heard a story from some production people in Louisiana that the Lost plane had made it into Baton Rouge for a bit. Even the casual banter I had with Carlton seemed to connect in all kinds of strange ways. For example, I mentioned in passing that one of the shows I was watching was The Good Place. Days later, when the series finale came out, I realized there was a striking connection between the finale and the Nashville Connection experiment video I had posted that day while meeting with Carlton. It's something they've never done in The Good Place before until the finale, and it's hard to miss. See if you can spot it. I know because I checked, and I also watched all the episodes of The Good Place, just like I did with Lost. Actually, there are a number of connections between this series and The Good Place finale, but also the penultimate episode, the one that aired on January 23rd, the same day when I met with Carlton. I don't want to belabor the point, though, so go and watch the episodes if you're curious. I will say I'm not exactly sure when I first saw those episodes. It was several days after they originally aired. And I want to say around that time, I already had a pretty good sense of what I was going to discuss in this video. But I'm not exactly sure about the timeline. The Good Place, like Lost, is an inspiration. So I'm not sure if it's a case of life imitating art or art imitating life. Possibly a little mix of both. One thing is clear though. I couldn't have seen episode 12 before meeting with Carlton because it hadn't aired yet. I would have to be really resourceful to get my hands on a script of a popular show before it aired. And uh, I'm just not that resourceful. Then there's Malcolm Gladwell's book, Talking to Strangers. I barely remembered it, my first read through of it, because it wasn't what I expected it to be. I stumbled upon it in my conversation with Carlton either by chance or serendipity. Only after the conversation with Carlton did I go back and reread it. And then I noticed just how well it related to what happened. I realized the book wasn't just a great tool for helping me process what happened. 
It also had references to the CIA, which ties into Carlton's work on Jack Ryan, and not unrelated to a short film I made that I dedicated to Carlton on Twitter. <laughs> The book also makes reference to research by SEER, a U.S. military program that stands for Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. SEER studies soldiers under stress and trains elite operatives on how not to divulge crucial information when captured. It's not unlike the kind of research that the Dharma Initiative might do, on Lost. And as it happens, the example about Seer takes place in Hawaii, where much of Lost was shot. And yes, there are even a couple of references to the number 23 in the book. At one point, someone calls attention to it, asking who picked February 23rd. On the one hand, Malcolm Gladwell's book was suggesting that, quite possibly, I got it all wrong. It happens sometimes when we're talking to strangers. And yet, it also affirmed my sense of interconnection throughout this story. Those are mixed signals you're sending me there, Malcolm Gladwell. Incidentally, the name of the short I dedicated to Carlton Cuse is called mixed signals. Is it crazy to think I was meant to meet with Carlton? If it isn't, then maybe you were meant to see this video. Actually, I did pray that the right people who could benefit from seeing this video would find it somehow. Although, to be fair, I'm still waiting to get answers for so many seemingly unanswered prayers. So no promises here, but wouldn't it be something if you and I are connected in all kinds of ways, ways that we can't even possibly begin to understand just yet. That would be encouraging. That would be a reason to keep pressing forward for me. These days, I could really use another friend or some additional encouragement. Maybe you can too. If so, I hope you'll reach out and say hello. It's been several weeks since my lunch with Carlton, and I'm still not sure what to make of it all. Was it all just a bunch of meaningless coincidences, or... Was there more to it? I'm not sure. I may never know for sure during this lifetime, but it seems like if anyone can help provide answers about it, then it would be Carlton. So I'm gonna to try to get this video to him, but I don't know how successful I'll be at that. After all, I've spent 10 years at this point trying to get in touch, and it seems like most, if not all, of those efforts prior to the lunch had no impact whatsoever. That's where you come in. If you know Carlton or know someone who does, would you consider passing along this video? Or you could just like, comment, or share this video with someone who might appreciate it. Every little bit helps. It would do my heart good to see something positive come from this video. But it's probably not the end of the world if that doesn't happen. Quite possibly, nothing much will change if that doesn't happen. I probably won't make more videos like this Entropy will probably take more of a toll on me. 
and certain dreams will fade away. That's all. Not the end of the world, but it would be impactful to me nonetheless. So, if you believe in connection, if you want to see things work out in a big picture way for me and for you, would you help me get this video to him? If so, I would be eternally grateful. It might not change the world, but it could mean the world to me. So. Thanks for any little thing that you can do to help. All right, now, if you've made it this far, thanks so much for watching. I know it's a lot to take in, so I appreciate you sticking with it until the end. I do hope I'll hear from you, even if I get one new connection that leads to a friendship of sorts that would make it worthwhile. So reach out and say hello. My email is nick at ncivides.com. Thanks so much for watching. Oh, there is one more thing I wanted to share before we go. After I shared my recommendation for Malcolm Gladwell's book, Talking to Strangers, Carlton recommended a book for me, The Kid Stays in the Picture. I was marginally aware of the book and documentary about producer Robert Evans, the man who helped bring about The Godfather and Love Story, but I don't remember reading it in the past. After the trip, I was curious, so I eventually picked it up on Audible. And a couple of things about the book surprise me. In one part of the book, Robert Evans talks about how he would allow up-and-coming actresses to borrow some of his nicer automobiles or cars that he was renting. He did that not because he was looking for sex or other favors. He just wanted to look out for them. That was surprising not something you hear from the typical power player in Hollywood. The Kid Stays in the Picture also goes into some detail about his work on the 1974 production of The Great Gatsby. Notable to me because Great Gatsby, the book, has special significance to me. It was the only novel I mentioned in Connection Experiment 2, the New Orleans Museum one that's been referenced before in this episode, but I didn't just mention it. I quoted from it, and The Great Gatsby had an influence on the overall story of that one, I would say. I felt a haunting loneliness sometimes, and felt it in others. Young clerks in the dusk, wasting the most poignant moments of night and life. And that was the last connection experiment I had published that was fully uploaded before I met with Carlton. There was something else as well. It turns out Robert Evans was a person who had a unique connection to esteemed actor Laurence Olivier, whose performance as Hamlet is still considered one of the finest. At the time, though, he was barely getting work because at the time, Laurence Olivier had cancer. And so the insurance companies that cover films didn't want to insure him. That didn't stop Robert Evans, though. He campaigned to get Laurence Olivier on his film pleaded with the insurance company to make it happen. It came together, and they were able to make Marathon Man together. 
Then Laurence Olivier's cancer went into remission and he continued to work as an actor for 13 years after that. In what Mr. Evans describes as possibly the most emotional embrace of his life, he encountered Laurence Olivier again at a later point. And Olivier said, I'm here because of you, dear Robert. I never believed in miracles. I was wrong. So there you have it. An interesting thing to read, certainly in context to this conversation. For someone who seemingly didn't know anything about me beyond what we discussed at lunch, Carlton Cuse, the showrunner behind Lost and Lock and Key, had made the consummate book recommendation for me. Perhaps the very book I needed to keep persevering just a little bit longer to keep dreaming even when it breaks my heart. There's even a section in The Kid Stays in the Picture about a Super Bowl story. Now, I had mentioned in passing to Carlton at lunch the New York Giants and their Super Bowl victory, but I didn't explain all the reasons why that was significant to me. Which brings up one final question. Just how much of the story does Carlton know or sense?